All right, time for our final speaker of the day uh, today, of our first day of Rexus. Uh, and our final speaker is from Netflix, uh, Hassan Sabirian, who is here to tell us about Rexus Ops, best practices for operating a large scale recommender system. Take it away, Hassan. Uh, my clicking is disabled. Uh, can AB look into it? A previous speaker needed to look at the feed in Zoom. I don't know if it's the same issue for you. We oh, see it okay. moving. I here. think it's fixed now. Yep. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ehsan, and uh, today I'm going to talk about Rexis Uh Now, as many of you know, running a large scale recommendation system is a very complex operation. And one aspect of it is that everything is very dynamic and changes very quickly. Uh, for example, new members, new items, uh, new codes gets merged to the production every day. Uh, so it's very dynamic. And the question is, how do we ensure that our system is working correctly in this very dynamic environment? And that's what Rexis Ops is about. These are lessons that we learned over the years. And they helped us to reduce our firefighting time allocate that time to our innovations and improving the user experience. And it also helped us to build trust with our stakeholders. Now, at a very high level, Rexis Ops has four components. It has issue detection, issue prediction, issue diagnosis, and issue resolution. Let's just start with the detection. Uh, detection is simply about detecting issues as soon as they happen. But this is the most challenging part of Rexis Ops because there are endless potential issues and some of them we don't even know yet. So the lessons that we learned in this category was that first of all, make sure that you implement all the known best practices. This includes unit tests, integration tests, all the ML ops, regular retraining. And the good news is that there are uh, many good online resources that you can use to learn about these things. So for example, this Google paper has an excellent checklist that you can go over them to see what are the gaps in your system. Uh, beyond this, the second lesson was that uh, make sure that you monitor your system end to end from your own perspective. And what I mean by that is that we always work in different teams, like there is the upstream team and low, uh, downstream team. Don't just rely on those teams to audit their input and out. If you are in the middle of things, make sure that you input your, uh, you audit your input from your own perspective, as well as you audit your output from your own perspective. And we found this very useful. We were able to capture uh, issues both in downstream and upstream of us, given that we were looking very carefully in the, into these things. The third lesson in the detection category is that make sure that you communicate and, uh, uh, with your stakeholders and understand their concerns. In the context of Rexis, we have two main stakeholders. There are members and there are IT. On the member side, the concerns are pretty straightforward. Every time that you see a member place something that's ranked low by your model, it's a potential issue. So make sure that you capture those cases, you monitor those cases, you study them. And these are great sources of inspiration for you to figure out what's missing and what your next innovation will be. On the other side, there are teams who are concerned with the health of the items. And you should engage with them and try to understand their concerns. In case of Netflix, when we talked to them, they told us that they are concerned about cold starting behavior as well as production bias. And these are very valid questions. These are actually open research questions in the community. And what we did was that we sat down with them and we tried to help them build tools and metrics to monitor for these concerns. And what we did was that we later converted those tools into the checks in our monitoring system and if any potential issues was happening, we, were, we went ahead and proactively investigated them and fixed them. And this was a great way of building trust with our stakeholders because they knew we understand their concerns and we are proactively trying to fix those things. Uh, now, everything that I said so far was about detecting. If something goes wrong, you can detect it and fix it. But it's even better if you can predict it. What happened? If I can predict that something is going to happen, I can then I have time to go and fix it before it happens. And again, in context of Netflix, we were concerned about cold starting. So we said that, is it possible that we can predict if an item is going to have cold start problem 
seven days before the launch time? And the answer was yes. We can try and train a model to predict the production's model behavior on the day of launch, and then based on that, we can flag things and investigate things. Uh, but this is a challenging problem because you have to predict the model's prediction. So this is two levels of prediction. But if you can make it work, and it's certainly possible, then it's very good because it will help you to get uh, ahead of your game and have like seven days to fix the issues and don't incur the issue in real production. So the lesson in this category is that really try to predict the issues before even they happen if you have a known type of issues. Now, either with detection or prediction, you found an issue and now you need to diagnose it. The very first step is that you need to reproduce the issue in isolation. But the problem is that these systems are very dynamic. So if you run the code now, you will get a different number than you run the code an hour ago. So for this, you need to make sure that you have sufficient logins in place so that if something happens, you can use that log data or log features or log facts that to reproduce the issue. And now, once you reproduce the issue, there are either two problems. It could be an input data problem or a model problem. And for the input data, really, you have a bunch of features, and you want to make sure that they have the right values. Now, the simple approach is that for every feature, you try to trace them back to the original facts and double check if everything is right or not. But there are these features that are very complex, and this process can be very costly or even sometimes impossible. And one trick that we typically use for that is that for every user we look at, and for every case, we look at the similar items or similar members. And then we check what's the typical range for this feature value. Are we out of range or are we, is anything abnormal? And an instance of this case was that one time we were investigating and we noticed that the language feature of an item was off. So upon further investigation, we figured out that three teams downstream of us uh, put the wrong language setting in some corner cases uh, for, the, uh, for this item. So this was an interesting thing because we were able to capture something that happened far from us in the, uh, in the stack. Now, if all the input data is right, the other potential issue is the model issue. And for that, you need to be able to inspect and interpret your model. Now, the field of interpretable machine learning is a big field, and there are a lot of tools that are available that you can use, like SHAP and LIME. Uh, but at least in my experience, at the end of the day, you will need to write your own custom tool to monitor exactly how your system is working or how your model is constructed. Because as the builder of the model, you have some insights about how the model should look like or where the model uh, has potential of going wrong. And again, an example in this category was that in one case, we figured out that uh, there was a bug in handling of our missing values for some certain cases. And again, this was an interesting case because this was a bug that was deep down in our code base and our checks was able to surface these bugs and we were able to correct it. Uh, so to summary, the lessons that we have in the diagnosis uh, section is, first of all, make sure that you set up the logging properly so that you can reproduce the issue. Make sure you have tools to check the validity of your input data and make sure you have tools to be able to inspect your models. Now, after you diagnose the issue, you need to resolve the issue. And the resolution is not really that different from regular software engineering. You can either apply a hot fix or you can go for a long-term solution. The main problem is that for ML models, applying a hot fix is very challenging because these models are highly optimized on these big, very giant data sets. And as soon as you try to alter them or modify them, then they become suboptimal and you're going to serve some optimal uh, recommendation in the rest of the ecosystem. Maybe it solves your problem here, but it's going to keep cost in the rest of the ecosystem. So this is the, one of the parts that you need to become creative and you need to work with your partner to come up with the solution that fixes the problem, but at the same time minimizes the cost to the rest of the ecosystem. And the first lesson in this category is that you should not only have one of these, but you should have a collection of hot fixes and for every hot fix, you should understand the costs and benefits and their trade-off so that when the time comes, you can make an informed decision of what's the best hot fix to use. 
The second lesson in the resolution part is that it, every issue make your Rexis ops better. If you were detecting the issue, try to predict the issue. If it was taking some time to resolve the issue, make sure that you can now resolve it within a couple of minutes or uh, make it much faster. Uh, this Rexis app is not something that you can do in one, uh, uh, one go. You have to iterate on it and improve it every time. And hopefully at some point, uh, everything is captured and you won't have that many issues. Now, we talked about these four components, detection, prediction, diagnosis, and resolution. But I want to end with this final lesson that applies to all of them. And that's to make sure that your Rexis ops is as frictionless as possible. And what I mean by that is that uh, you have checks that you run in the prediction and detection phase. So make sure that those checks are running automatically on a regular basis. And if there is a time where a human judgment is needed, let's say in the diagnosis part or in the resolution part, make sure that that person has all the required information that they need to make a decision ready for them so that they can just quickly look at those things and make a decision. And finally, if they made a decision and they need to uh, do a quick action like deploying a hotfix, make sure that they can do that with only a couple of clicks so that the whole process of resolving an issue is as seamless as possible. Uh, so that was it uh, about Rexis Ops. Thanks for listening uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, I see we have someone coming up to the microphone in the room, so let's take a physical, team physical uh, question. All right, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I just had a question, you mentioned for the cold star problem, uh, you had to predict what your model in production was going to predict. I wonder, you know, what, what do you mean by that, and like to what extent can you use existing data, maybe existing uh, movies in your case or shows that look similar to what you're gonna be uh, releasing soon. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, so for the cold star problem, you're trying to predict essentially like, uh, you know, how is the model going to react to novel items, uh, to something that you're gonna release soon? Like, um, mm -hmm. is that something that you do by, like how, how do you approach that? And like, do you, do you just leverage the existing data that you already have okay, okay. in order to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. actually that's a very good question and I have to make some clarification. So cold start will always be a problem in the recommendation system. So it will take some time to, for the system and for the items to be warmed up to the rest of the ecosystem. And you can always try to minimize the cold start time. What I meant by cold start problem was an item having cold start time longer than usual. Uh, and uh, you can try to predict that with the existing signals that are in the system. So uh, you can compare your signals with the signals that you got a week ago for another item and see how much, how did that item perform in the platform and how long it took to go from cold start to the warm start case and see how much this new item is going to take to go to the warm start case. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Good question. Time for a couple of uh, online questions. The first one is from Sean Wilner from Vodi. Uh, he ha would like to know a little bit more about reproducibility. Uh, so his question is, given the highly dynamic nature of your recommender model, uh, so today is different to yesterday, is different to tomorrow, uh, how can you reproduce issues before they happen? Uh, so in the seven day early cold start example uh, for the diagnosis step. Yes, uh, so I think when we try to predict that something is going to happen, uh, it basically means that, let's say we try to simulate our system and we saw what's going to happen. And in this specific prediction case, because we're simulating the system, reprodu reproducing the issue is not that difficult. So the same way that we simulated the system, we can run it again with the same set of data set that we logged before. So we can uh, uh, reproduce the problem. Uh, in the case of when you want to detect something, that's a more difficult way of reproducing because you want to see what happened yesterday. But in case where we're trying to simulate future, reprodu reproducing those experiments are much easier. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a question from Vedant Powell. 
Uh, he's asking about different devices. So different devices like the mobile, TV, tablet, uh, they have different recommendations. So how does Netflix manage to serve recommendations depending on the device? Oh, uh, I'm not sure if this is like very relevant to the Rexis apps, but uh, our recommendation system are able to capture the context around the request and they can tailor their recommendations based on the device that they're serving. Uh, there are different techniques for this. Like the main one is that like in the very simple form, you can uh, featureize the type of device as a feature in your model and try to learn from it. Yeah, thank you. I understand the question was, was only somewhat tangentially related to the talk, but it was a very popular one online. Um, a question from Kevin who asks, can you maybe say a little bit more about how you see the difference between data engineering versus ML ops, and I guess also uh, Rexus uh, DevOps? Uh, so I think this, uh, let me start with the ML ops. I think the ML ops is a very generic term that applies to all the machine learning parts uh, or all the machine learning system. Then Rexus ops is a subset of ML ops that's focused on the recommender systems. And as I said, uh, when you look at the issues such as like cold starting or engage, uh, direct engagement with the partner teams, uh, I think these are the cases where Rexis Ops itself, uh, that, that there are things that are very specific to recommender systems, or again, like the hot fixes that you can develop for these things. Uh, and the data engineering side, I think it's pretty different. Like there is like a big component of machine learning itself uh, that's going to use the data for these things. And of course, like machine learning is as like the quality of your model is as good as the quality of your uh, data. But there are a lot of things that go in, that goes on for the machine learning components to extract that uh, useful information out of data. Again, when you think about like the way that you have to uh, apply a hotfix, you need to have deep knowledge of machine learning to be able to find a solution that fixes the problem at the same time and at the same time minimizes the cost to the rest of the ecosystem. Okay, thank you. I think we have one last question from in the hall here. Yeah, thanks for sharing uh, and, and highlighting this, uh, this approach, this method. Um, how far do you think, uh, looking at the diagnosis and both the hotfixes, how far do you think that we are in the connection between those two in automatically deploying a hotfix based on a diagnosis? Uh, is it something soon or are we still far out? Uh, yeah, as I said, like the hotfixes always have some problem, have some costs associated with them. So we always have like a final human uh, or final uh, review before applying these things. Uh, but uh, over the years, we have become better and better in quantifying the pros and cons of each of these things uh, so that the person that needs to make a decision can make decision very quickly. And uh, again, over the years, we have become better and better. So uh, we don't really need that many of those things uh, these days. Uh, because ev with every issue, we either try to make it better and, or we try to make our modeling assumptions better so that it doesn't happen. Uh, and I think we are in a good situation right now that we don't need to make those decisions that often. Cool. Excited to see where it's heading. Thanks. Thank All right. Uh, thank you again. <laughs> and I'm a f that is the uh, last of our speakers for tonight. Uh, for Team Virtual, hi, all you guys. Uh, we're going to continue on uh, Wonder Me after this. Uh, and for the people uh, in the other room or in this room, uh, we have a reception which will be going on for a little bit yet. Uh, so I hope to see you there, Frederick. Thanks a lot. <laughs>